He was trying to get out of people's mind the unconscious motivations that they had for purchasing. Uh, these could be sexual, they could be psychological, they could be sociological, they could be a demand for status, a demand for recognition. There were things that people couldn't verbalize or wouldn't verbalize because they were too secret to them. They were too much a part of their nature and they, were, they would be embarrassed. They would be embarrassed if they came out and said things like this. He would interview people, but not ask them direct questions, but let them talk freely like you do in psychoanalysis. And that was his background. And so he said, why can't we have a group therapy session about products? All right? And so Dichter built this room up above his garage, and it, he said, we can have psychoanalysis of products. They can actually act out and verbalize their wants and needs. What we're going to do is try a couple of these uh, salad dressings. Now let's see what happens. There is our typical housewife. She doesn't follow the instructions. And they could be observed and watched and other people could comment and they could talk about it and everybody could join in. He was the first to do this. This was absolutely the first thing that was ever done. And he had a movie projector up there where you could show advertisements and things like that and people could react to them and he invented the whole technique for mining the unconscious about the hidden psychological wants that people had about products. This became the focus group. It worked! Victor's breakthrough came with a focus group study he did for Betty Crocker Foods. Like many food manufacturers in the early 50s, they had invented a new range of instant convenience foods. But although consumers had told market researchers they would welcome the idea, in fact, they were refusing to buy them. The worst problem was the Betty Crocker cake mix. Dicta did a series of focus groups where housewives free associated about the cake mix. He concluded that they felt unconscious guilt at the new image being promoted of ease and convenience. In other words, he understood that the barrier to the consumption of the product was the housewife's feeling of guilt about using it. They basically, on one hand, wanted to make it easy for themselves, but they felt guilty about it. So what you've got to do in those circumstances is remove the barrier, the barrier being guilt. The way you do that is to give the housewife a greater sense of participation. And how do you do that? By adding an egg. Simple as that. As simple as that. Dicta told Betty Crocker to put an instruction on the packet that the housewife should add an egg. It would be an unconscious symbol, he said, of the housewife mixing in her own eggs as a gift to her husband, and so would lessen the guilt. Betty Crocker did it, and the sales soared. My cake is ready. The consumer may have basic needs that the consumer himself or herself doesn't fully understand. You have to know what those needs are in order to fully exploit the consumer. Is it wrong to give people what they want by taking away their defenses, helping re remove their defenses? It seems so much longer than last year. It is. Nearly four inches longer in some models. Oh! Dicta's success led to a rush by corporations and advertising agencies to employ psychoanalysts. They became known as the Depth Boys, and they promised to show companies how to make millions by connecting their products with people's hidden desires. Dicta himself became a millionaire, famous for inventing slogans like, A Tiger in Your Tank. Even the marketing of the Barbie doll came from a children's focus group. And so it goes. But Dichter was convinced that this was far more than just selling. Like Anna Freud, he believed that the environment could be used to strengthen the human personality. And products have the power both to sate inner desires and give people a feeling of common identity with those around them. It was a strategy for creating a stable society. Dichter called it the strategy of desire. To understand a stable citizen, 
you have to know that modern man quite often tries to work off his frustrations by spending on self-gratification. Modern man is eternally ready to fill out his self-image by purchasing products which complement it. If you identify yourself with a product, it can have a therapeutic value. It improves your self-image and you become a more secure person and you have suddenly this confidence of going out in the world and doing what you want successfully. Bernard believed that that would then improve the whole of our society and become the best society on this planet. By the early 50s, the ideas of psychoanalysis had penetrated deep into American life. The psychoanalysts themselves became rich and powerful. Many had consulting rooms overlooking Central Park in New York. Politicians and famous writers like Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams became their patients. They were seeking not just help, but to understand the hidden roots of human behavior. We were sought after. Washington was interested in what we think. You know, the, the important, important writers, important politicians were undergoing psychoanalysis. It was, we had, we had waiting lists because there were so many patients that wanted to be analyzed. So it, it gave us a little bit of a swellhead. And as the psychoanalyst's ideas took hold in America, a new elite began to emerge in politics, social planning, and in business. What linked this elite was the assumption that the masses were fundamentally irrational. To make a free market democracy like America work, one had to use psychological techniques to control mass irrationality. They actually believed that this elite was necessary because individual citizens were not capable if left alone, of being democratic citizens. The elite was necessary in order to create the conditions that would produce individuals capable of behaving as a, uh, a good consumer and also behaving as a democratic citizen. They didn't see uh, their activities as anti-democratic, as undermining the capacity of individual citizens for democracy, quite the opposite. They understood that they were creating uh, the conditions for uh, democracy's survival and future. The rise of psychoanalysis to power in America was an extraordinary triumph for Anna Freud and her tireless promotion of her ideas. She remained in England, living with Dorothy Burlingham. On the surface, it was an idyllic life. She and Dorothy had bought a weekend cottage on the Suffolk coast. And in the summers, Dorothy's children came from America to visit with the grandchildren. But underneath, things were going badly wrong. Both Bob and Mabby Burlingham, who Anna Freud had analysed in the 1930s, had suffered personal breakdowns and their marriages were collapsing. Bob was drinking heavily and Mabby suffered terrible anxieties. The real reasons for the visits to England were yet more analysis with Anna Freud. Well, the problem was that it didn't look very good, did it? because here you have somebody who's having nervous breakdowns and uh, is, is uh, having alcoholic binges and uh, this is not exactly <laughs> doesn't really sit well um, well you know from a humane standpoint obviously this is not desirable you know you want to help these people but it also had the wider ramifications of everybody in, in, in analysis in analytic circles knew that Bob and Mabby were uh, guinea pigs they were the living proof that this was a wonderful process. It was very much swept under the rug. It really it didn't get out. I mean, these people had such, uh, their, their power and influence was such uh, that, you know, you were very careful. Anna Freud was a very powerful person, and um, you were the grandchildren, and uh, she knew a great deal more than you did about what went on in your parents' lives and so forth. It was not something you were going to tangle with, and you were a product of the whole situation. Uh, but at the same time, we all knew that something was really out of whack. 
As she grew older, she became more and more important, didn't she? Politically and scientifically, but she didn't know when to stop. She was a bit too righteous. Uh, what she did was always the thing, and she would never, to my, my knowledge, acknowledge that she could make a mistake or be wrong. That is my feeling.